Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Getting to Grips with Social Prescribing. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to come and join us to find out what social prescribing is all about. Um, anyway, my name is Eileen Bellot, and I run an organization called Quest Life, which is an arts and cultural organization. And um, today we have a number of um, people presenting and talking to you to demystify the whole social prescribing thing. So thanks anyway for coming. Um, it'd really be great to find out where people are coming from. So if you can in, pop into the chat, um, whereabouts you are coming from. So let's have a look and see um, where people are. Chicago, wow. Northamptonshire. Nottingham, London, Manchester, Cornwall, East London, Leeds, Kingston upon Thames, Lancashire, another London person, hello Londoners, Birmingham, South East London, Northampton, another London person, anyone else? But, but Buckinghamshire. Yeah, that's great. Well done. Thank you so much. And also, if you can just pop into the chat, please. Um, if you, um, on a scale of one to three, one being you know lots about social prescribing, if you and three being nothing, can you just pop a number in the chat so that we get a sense of where people are with social prescribing? So lots of ones and twos. Oh, there's a three. Yeah, two, three. That's great. That's really great to help us understand where people are coming from in terms of their knowledge around this subject. Anyway, um, thank you again for that. Um, what I would just like to do is we're going to start off with uh, talking to Mike Wilson, um, who is the director of um, Public Voices. And he's going to be talking to you today about um, social prescribing, trying to demystify what it is and how they are currently working with social prescribing. So, um, Mike, can I introduce you to the um, the audience today? Mike, if you could uh, take your camera off. Hi, Mike. Hi. Nice to see everybody. Well, yeah. Mike, can you just start by just introducing um, what is it you do and a little bit about your organisation, and then I'll hand over to you to do your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Eileen. So, uh, yeah, my name's Mike, Mike Wilson. I'm the director of a social enterprise called Public Voice. Um, we deliver a number of projects, including Health Watch. If some of you are familiar with um, with the Health Watch program, it's, an, it's a statutory program for users of health and social care. So we do that, and we do a range of other delivery as well, around mainly around service users. And our strap line is service improvement through user engagement. So pretty well everything we do is designed around trying to achieve that objective. Um, and social prescribing is a really good case in point. So uh, we work in Haringey, as far as social prescribing is concerned, in Tottenham. Uh, we're on TV tonight. I'm sure some of you will be watching. Um, yeah, uh, important game against Liverpool. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was going to be something about social prescribing, Mike. Oh, no, no. So we've got to, I've got to finish this before 8 o'clock. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so that's who we are. We, we employ 11 social prescribers who work in GP practices um, and have done since last September when NHS England introduced this new programme. Um, it's very attractive to GPs because um, NHS England pay all the costs for social prescribers. They pay their salary. And they now pay us a, a small management fee. So that all works really well. Um, and it's grown from strength to strength. Um, so in Haringey and I think elsewhere, GPs are really keen to employ more social prescribers. And from April, I think we'll be adding a few more to our to our number. Uh, so sort of that's me, and that's what we do as far as social prescribing is concerned. And I'm um, very happy to talk to you um, a bit about it, what we do, what I think it's about, uh, and, and get your views as well.
That's great. Thank you, Tracy. Um, I'm doing the easy bit. I'm just talking. Tracy's doing the difficult techie <laughs> bit, which is which is tends to be beyond me. So my name isn't Nulifer Yildaran, as, as you might have guessed. Uh, Nulifer is one of our social prescribers. She's Turkish um, and she's been working for us since uh, October last year. And uh, Nulifer did a presentation um, for other social prescribers and GPs and some other meetings she's been going to around what social prescribing is. So it's such a good presentation, I thought, I hope, hope you agree, that um, I haven't bothered to do one of my own. And in a way, I think it's nicer to use a presentation for somebody who's doing the job, because that'll tell you exactly actually what they do do uh, and pick up some of the issues. So, um, so hopefully you'll agree that, um, that it, it's a good introduction and a good explanation. So Nulifer works on down on the left hand side, you'll see Arcadian Gardens, Cheshire Road Surgery, Stuart Crescent. So Nulifer works in a primary care network, which um, I think some of you will be familiar with. That's a group of GP surgeries. So across uh, England, all GP surgeries or the vast majority have had to come together into networks that are called primary care networks. And within Nulifer's primary care network, there are these separate GP practices. Um, and Nulifer moves from one to the other. At the moment, she's working remotely and goes into um, uh, one of the uh, one of the practices once a week um, uh, to do the uh, admin around uh, EMIS, which is the, the CRM system. So if we'd like to move on to the next slide. OK, so what is social prescribing? Um, so Nulifer describes it. Thus, so it's basically um, a system where health professionals um, make referrals of patients to a social prescriber. And those patients are people who they may have a medical physical health problem, um, but very often the, the medical health problem is caused by other things or, or made worse by other things. Could be loneliness, isolation, depression, um, uh, something, a tragic thing that's happened in their life. Um, and actually what the doctor can prescribe is the medicine um, which can help the symptoms but very often doesn't really address the cause. So social prescribers talk to that person, have an interview with them, usually 45 minutes is the first interview and ask them what they think the issues are for them. So, so the whole practice starts with the person. So it's not us saying what we think the problem is or what we think the solution is it's, it's actually asking the person what they think the problem is and how they think we might help um, in our case we ask them to identify two things two issues for them that they think we could help with and the reason we do that is because if we don't limit it um, we'll get a whole range a whole number of issues coming out and it'll be impossible to really achieve anything so we start off by addressing the two serious issues for people so um, as, as we say here, we recognize that people's health is determined by lots of things, you know, not just physical issues, but social, economic, environmental factors. Uh, and we try and address those as best we can. And at the moment, as you might imagine, when people are locked down in COVID, some of these other issues are really coming to the fore and they're causing a lot of other mental and physical health problems. So our social prescribers are incredibly busy. Um, doing stuff that's more complex than they, they did before. Um, so just listed down there some of the things that uh, people might need um, and some of the things we might be talking to them about. So if we move on to the next slide. So what, what are the issues? These are the sorts of issues that people are, are raising with us. So it could be around finance. Um, where we work in Tottenham, um, there are a lot of people are really just on the threshold of only just managing and a lot of them aren't managing. So lots of people come to food banks. I work in an office uh, where there is also a food bank and three days a week we have about 120 people queuing up outside to come in and, uh, and get parcels of food. So the moment that's a big issue and it'll become a bigger issue um, as the months go ahead. And you probably saw the unemployment figures yesterday and today they've gone up remarkably um, and very worryingly as, as we all knew they would. So um, there's issues around um, getting back to work and issues around learning, which is good for people. And we try and address those sometimes through 
trying to give people volunteering opportunities, which are a good way to get into work. Um, and if we can overcome their, their maybe their lack of self-confidence, um, that is also a step in the right direction. And that's the sort of thing our social prescribers do. A lot of the referrals are around older people. Um, and older people frequently are very socially isolated. Their family uh, may have gone, um, their friends uh, may have all passed away, um, and they're very often on their own for most of the week. And the conversation our social prescribers have with them is one of the few conversations they might have during the week. Um, we have a lot of opportunities, a lot of networks, a lot of systems to try and help those people re-engage. And when we can talk a bit about that um, later on, perhaps. So it's probably a good point I wish to make the distinction between the social prescriber and the activities that the social prescriber prescribes to. Um, so there is a distinction. So the social prescriber is, in a sense, the conduit, the signposter to other alternatives, other ways of helping people engage. Um, carers have had a particular problem at the moment. And uh, the last nine, 10 months have been really dreadful for carers. A lot of the carers um, aren't registered as carers, so they don't get no extra support. Uh, the person they're caring for may have gone into day centres in normal times. Now the day centres are closed, so they're having to cope with those people at home. And in a way, as, as I've said before to people, the carers um, suffer the same problems as those people they're caring for, plus other problems because they're having to take that responsibility on themselves. So they're trying to manage the person they're caring for and manage their own lives. And very often the carer and the person being cared for are quite elderly, which, which creates other issues. Housing is becoming an increasing issue. Probably 30 or 40 percent of the referrals we get are, include housing issues, problems with housing, uh, either poor quality housing or lack of housing or losing their housing through evictions, through no, no fault of their own uh, in, in most cases. Um, and the lockdown has created extremely difficult circumstances for people. In Haringey, we had nearly 10,000 people who were sheltering. That was when the, the government used the definition of, of sheltered. And um, so they weren't going out at all. They were having food delivered. They were depending on mutual aid groups, depending on some of our other services which we provide as an organisation. So um, that's been particularly challenging both for those people and also our social prescribers over the last few months. So if we'd like to move on to the next slide. So what does a social prescriber do? So they work with the individual, their families very often and their carers. So very often it's the family that can provide support. And sometimes the family has become um, distanced from that person. So there may be some issues that the social prescriber can help mediate uh, and get those people back talking to each other and supporting each other again. The process starts with building trust and relationships. Um, and generally what our social prescribers find is once they've established that relationship, it's extremely difficult to actually move people on. Um, the role of the social prescriber um, when we started was to limit their work with somebody to a maximum of 12 hours, probably a couple of face-to-face -face appointments, and then submit some telephone catch-ups and telephone appointments along the way. Um, so the idea was that have a throughput of clients or patients. Um, that has tended to fall apart during COVID because people um, are reluctant to move on and very often there's nothing for them to move on to. Um, which is a particular issue. So social prescribers are retaining their clients for much longer than we anticipated. As I said earlier, we give people time to talk about what matters to them, what's important for them, and what are the issues that they want help with. And then we co-produce an action plan. So we start off by talking to people about what they want. We then talk about what could they do, what do they think they could do to help themselves, uh, and how do they think we could help them, or some other agency, or organization might help them and then we produce an action plan um, they sign it off and we sign it off and then that's something we work towards achieving uh, and we monitor progress as, as, as the weeks go on our whole objective is to enable people to have more control over their lives uh, and as a result improve their house health outcomes it's very challenging to avoid developing a dependency, which is exactly the opposite of what we are supposed to be doing. But as I said at the moment, the, it's very, very easy to establish that level of dependency 
um, and that is currently really challenging. But the whole objective is to actually do the opposite and help people become independent. Um, we connect people to local community groups, activities and support services. Uh, before COVID, um, that was relatively straightforward. We've got a directory of services in the area we could refer people to. Um, now, most of those services through the voluntary and community sector have stopped. Uh, they've either stopped for good or they've just stopped for a while until we get back to some sort of normality. So there is a lot less now we can actually direct people to. Uh, and most of the things we can direct to are virtual. And many people don't have an email address um, and they don't have the ability to use Teams or Zoom or whatever. They can use the phone um, and, and that's about it. And some of them don't have a phone. Um, so that's equally challenging. So if we move on to the next slide. So what isn't it? What is social prescribing not? And it's really important to understand what social prescribing we shouldn't be doing. Um, so we shouldn't be um, supporting people to services and activities where the person lacks the skills and confidence to get there themselves. So, um, so we need to be judging what people can cope with and then um, making recommendations that, that fit that bill. Um, it's not health coaching. Uh, we've just actually recruited a health coach. And we're going to start health and wellbeing coaching. Um, it's different from social prescribing. Because health and wellbeing coaching is basically about he helping people change their behaviour. It's more intense. It's more one-to-one, uh, -one, um, uh, five, six, seven, eight sessions with somebody. Um, and it's helping people actually change the way they see the world and help helping them change their behaviour, getting more control over their lives. It's not about carrying on admin work for the GP or other health clinicians, although a number of GPs seem to think it is. So um, that can be quite challenging to actually try and tell them actually that's not what the social prescriber is there to do. And when we started this, it's, it's, very, it's very new in most places, not everywhere, it's very new in most places. And so the GPs themselves didn't really understand what it was all about. So it's quite, it's quite uh, understandable that um, you know, maybe they get hold of the wrong end of the stick. Um, and we don't also tell people what they should do. So we don't say you should join this activity. We don't say you should go and try and get this service. We work with them so they decide that's what they want to do. Uh, and it's very important uh, to do that. Otherwise, they won't be motivated. So uh, if we move on to the next slide. So who can benefit from social prescribing? So. Um, we work with people who are over 18. I think some social prescribers work with children. Um, we, we don't work with directly with children. We just work with adults over 18. And we work sometimes with families and sometimes maybe the issue is with a child, but we're working with the adult to help that child with their issues, not, not directly with the child. We're not, we're not qualified to do that. An awful lot of people we deal with are lonely and isolated. And the idea really is to try and reconnect them either reconnect them with their friends, neighbours or family or reconnect them into social networks, which as I said before is challenging at the moment because the social networks are, are falling apart. Um, people who have long-term conditions um, and need to manage them and help them manage them. So that's a, they're a very important cohort. I think probably 30 or 40% of the people we deal with have got some sort of mental health need. Um, usually it's sort of low level depression and anxiety but sometimes it's, it's more serious than that, in which case uh, we signpost people onto the mental health services and we don't, we don't deal with those ourselves because we're not equipped to do that. So um, uh, many people don't just have one problem, they have three or four problems. And, and I think as we all know, if something goes wrong in your life, it tends to affect other things as well. So somebody might have lost their job, that'll create a debt problem, um, that'll create a housing problem because they're not paying their rent, and it'll it will produce a, a problem uh, with that lack of confidence, lack of self-esteem, so people can rapidly go downhill. Um, the idea initially of social prescribing, and I think it's still the idea, is to free up time for GPs to focus on those patients who actually need the GP support. So it's focusing on those who maybe phone up once a week for appointments with the GP, who the GP can't really help anymore, so we take those patients and work with them. And the idea is that it frees up time with the GP, it helps the person because they actually don't need any more pills, there's nothing the GP can do for them. And hopefully, um, 
it moves them on into a, into a better place. Uh, and many of the people we work with are carers. And as I said before, carers have particularly suffered at the moment because of their, their responsibilities and the difficulties of them getting services. Getting food, for example, is, is a big issue. Getting medicine was a big issue for those who were shielding. Um, as another project, we, we actually had a medication delivery service, so we were able to help those people. Um, uh, but you know, not everybody was that, was that fortunate. So do we move on to the next slide. So why social prescribing? Um, so what number of GP appointments focus on wider social needs? So what, uh, this is a question. So maybe put in the chat what you think. So um, uh, do you think uh, one in three GP appointments focus on wider social needs, one in five, one in seven, or one in 10? So if you want to um, have a guess and, um, well, you may already know the answer, in which case you're not guessing, um, you can stick that in the, stick that in the chat. Um, and uh, the next slide might give you the answer. I'm not, I'm not really sure, actually. It's, what's the next slide tell us? There, one in five. There we go. Um, so that allows clinicians to concentrate on the medical problems and the social prescribers concentrate on those things that they can impact on. Uh, and, and it's one of the services we, we get loads and loads of compliments. It's, I mean, it's very satisfying. Um, the social prescribers get letters from people thanking them for changing their lives or, or whatever. And it's, um, it's, it's really wonderful when they get that sort of feedback and we get it very often. So it, it clearly is helping a lot of people and it can't help everybody, but it certainly seems to be helping a lot. Um, so should we move on to the next slide? Okay, does social prescribing work? So if uh, anybody's interested in getting more information, there's a couple of links there. There's lots and lots of information about social prescribing. Uh, the resources uh, are being developed at a regional level um, and there's lots of training, there's lots of advice. There are lots of peer-to-peer -peer meetings because being a social prescriber can be very isolating as you might imagine. They work by themselves. themselves. We employ them, but they're working in GP surgeries. Um, we had a Christmas party yesterday, um, a virtual one, and uh, we've got about 30 staff and the social prescribers, it was the first opportunity they actually met a number of our other staff team. So they, they, they really enjoyed that. So that's one of our challenges is to integrate them more effectively into, uh, into the other things that we're doing. So it's a pretty lonely job um, uh, and they do need a, a lot of support. And in some areas there's been a very high turnover. We've been very lucky. Um, I think we've, we've uh, two, two have left um, one, one for reasons that, you know, which were nothing to do with the job and the other one found the job rather too challenging. So, um, so we've been very fortunate, but it is, it is difficult, it is um, challenging, um, and you do need a lot of resources and some support around you. So uh, very easy to find out about it. And they're two really good links. So anybody who's interested, you know, have a look at those. And um, yeah, you'll find out a lot more than I've been able to tell you. Okay. Thank you so much for that, Mike. Um, just for those of you, um, I've put some of those links in the chat. And for those people who are putting questions together, if you could pop them in the Q&A um, section that, rather than the chat, then that way we won't miss any of your questions. But thank you so much for that, Mike. Mike, it'd be really um, useful to find out why your organization got involved with social prescribing to kind of get a sense of, 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 of the um, social prescribing in your organization. Well, I think it was, it was because of some of the other work we do. We do, we deliver Health Watch, which is around um, health and social care users. We do a lot of work with GPs. We do a lot of work with the local hospitals. Um, we've got other projects which involve signposting. So the, one of the points I was going to make was that you don't have to be in a social, you don't have to be in a, a, a GP surgery to be a social prescriber. So we've got another project called Reach and Connect, which focuses on supporting older people. And we have eight, we call them community connectors, who work out in the locality. They've all got caseloads of um, people over 50 in, in, in their case. Um, and they're basically social prescribers. So they're working with people to overcome a lot of complex issues in their life. They're not, ref we don't get referrals direct from GPs as the social prescribers do, but we do get referrals from social prescribers. So it seemed to be a really good fit for us when the opportunity came up. So we jumped into it 
um, straight away in, uh, in June or July last year. And it really reinforces lots of other things that we do. As I say, social prescribers refer to our community connectors. We've got something called Haringey Circle, which is a membership organization for people over 50. Um, so the referrals, well, there are referrals from there and everything sort of fits together really, really nicely. Um, and they can help each other. Um, it's one of the things that social prescribers will learn is that you, you never stop learning. There's always something out there you didn't know existed. There's always yeah. something going on and you think, oh, I didn't know that. You stick that on your list. And um, so there's, you're learning all the time. Um, so that's why, that's why we did it. Um, and, it's, and it's really paid off, I think. We've got great relationships with the GPs um, and uh, it's, it's sort of, it's helped our other work. And are you actually contracted to deliver that service? And if so, who, who, who contracts that kind of service? And well, do you have to bid for it as an open bid? How, how, how did you get involved? No, um, that's, it's, quite, it's quite tricky because the primary care networks um, aren't legal entities. So they, so they can't, they're not capable of having a contract. We can't contract with them because they actually don't exist legally. So we have a service level agreement with them. Mm -hmm. So it's very, it's quite a complicated SLA. Um, we were really lucky. Um, you know, there was no competition because it all happened very quickly. I think NHS England wrote in June, so they start this thing in July, <laughs> as, as is usually the case. Um, and uh, GPs didn't know what on earth it was. So. Yeah. So we were there. I personally got a, a, a background in health um, and I'm very familiar with Bromley by Bow, which you yes, I know them. Yeah. Of. And yeah. you know, they're the, the benchmark really for social prescribing. They've been doing it for 15 years. Mm. Um, so I had a, a lot to do with them in a previous life. So I did know something about it. Um, so when the opportunity came up, we just sort of got in there um, and it's flourished, it's flourished from there on in. Yeah, well done. Great, thank you so much, Mike. And um, of those of you um, who want to start popping questions um, into the Q&A box for Mike, because some of us can hold on to these questions and remember them, <laughs> but we will be having coming back to Q&As right at the end of all of the speakers. So okay. thank you very much, Mike. Um, so um, I'd like to uh, move on and introduce Stephanie McKinley. I hope I'm saying that right, um, Stephanie. Um, so Stephanie, um, welcome. Nice to meet you in the yes. face. Yes, yes, nice to, nice to meet you. And thank you very much for asking me to come along and talk. You're very welcome. Uh, Stephanie, what I'd like you to do maybe is to say a little bit about um, your organization and your role within your organization, and then you can start your presentation. So okay. thank you, over to you then. Thanks. Um, so I work for an organization called London Plus, and we are an infrastructure organization for the voluntary sector. So we work across the voluntary sector and we run various networks. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you about one specifically today that I run, but we also run what's called a CVS network, which is all the community voluntary actions and all the directors come together and we run that network across all the um, boroughs of London. And we also run a network for the volunteer centres. So those two organisations or those two structures work together quite closely. And obviously with, with what's been happening recently with pandemic, since we've had that, they've had to work even more closely together. And I um, run what's called the social prescribing network. Uh, and so I can talk a bit more about my role as part of my presentation, if, if that's okay, um, just because that's partly what I'm sort of here to talk about. So I don't know if that, that's enough background to sort of start with. Yes, that's fine. Okay, so if we can open the presentation. <laughs> I'm hoping this all works. Um, yeah, so as I said, um, we're an infrastructure organisation and I'm part of the third network called the Social Prescribing Network. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, if we're on the background, because I can't see at the moment. Um, so I'm presuming that's where we need to be. Yes, we are on background. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so basically, this is a brand new network that's got set up and we had a really fantastic 
uh, presentation from Mike about what social prescribing actually is. And it's the conversation that gets that takes place between an individual and a social prescribing link worker. The, bit, the, the, the other bit of the system that he sort of referred to, which is the bit that I really deal with, is the activities that those social prescribing link workers actually um, prescribe people to. So I work for a network of voluntary sector organisations who deliver social prescribing activities. So, and we've been, a bit of the background really is we, we've, we've been, we're funded by a Greater London Authority, so the Mayor's Office. And for those of you who aren't aware, the mayor's really keen on social prescribing, has a lot of strategies that he's put together. I think it's a 10 year one, actually, as well. I haven't actually got the link, but I can find that out for you, Eileen, if people are interested in reading more about social prescribing and it happening across London and really making this part of, um, you know, our community's health and well-being, as Mike sort of referred to before. And as I said, we, we basically I work with all organisations across the voluntary sector who deliver social prescribing activities. Now, the first thing to sort of say about that is that that involves, you can imagine how many organisations that involves. So we're sort of slowly starting to track that. We only came into existence in April and I really only came into the job back in, in October. So we're very, very new as a network. And we really see ourselves as London Plus as a conduit and a connector between people. So we don't necessarily deliver anything. We support people. We amplify the voice of the voluntary sector. And the thing that Eileen wanted me to sort of mention was around um, how, much, how, how all the different parts all work together. And it's pretty complicated as... Mike sort of mentioned some of them. So there's the primary care networks and things, but there's also other bigger strategic players who are working across London to really create this and embed it as a way of working and supporting that to happen as a, as a really good um, evidence base for supporting communities' health and well-being. So one of them is the Greater London Authority, the GLA that I mentioned. Another one is an organisation called... Um, the Healthy London Partnership and they're an organisation that kind of broker communications and support kind of conversations to happen with all different sectors including the NHS so we have a link with them very strong link um, on behalf of the voluntary sector and for our members to talk to the NHS around what's happening with, with um, the voluntary sector and the needs that we may have, our challenges, that the successes that we have. So they become really aware of how important the voluntary sector is. Um, we also have links with, even more specifically, with um, the, Mike mentioned about link workers. The link workers actually have, um, as part of Healthy London Partnership, the London Regional a learning coordinator um, for link workers, and that literally is her title. And she works with all the link workers across London to support them around some of the things Mike sort of alluded to, which is, you know, helping them make sure that they aren't being seen as, uh, uh, you know, clinical uh, as administrative leads, and th and part of that for the GP, helping them to under helping the GPs to understand what their role is, what their role isn't those kind of things, as well as supporting them around clinical supervision. If they are um, being supported and managed, some of them are managed, as Mike said, in the primary care networks, but some of them are managed um, by the voluntary sector. So we have links with them that way. So we have that link as well. And then we also have closer links again with other parts of Greater London Authority who are involved in social prescribing. So we have links with community engagement team, we have links with the uh, mission team that the GLA is currently working on for a whole recovery mission for COVID-19. We have links with cultural and art. So there's a big, big, um, we've got our tentacles, I suppose, on behalf of the voluntary sector um, for social prescribing in all these different parts of the system trying to influence. If we go on to the next slide, please, uh, that would be really helpful. Um, 
And so these are some of the aims really for our members. So we, so I'll give you a link if you want to join the social prescribing network um, at the end of the presentation. But really our role is about promoting social prescribing and its role in improving health and wellbeing from the voluntary sector perspective. It's felt a little bit like, and those, those of us who are here from the voluntary sector today, we kind of know we've actually been doing social prescribing for a long, long time. It's kind of been sort of, you know, renamed as something new, but really it's anything that we're doing to support our communities around health and wellbeing. And after all, you could probably argue that's what the voluntary sector just does. It's its bread and butter. Um, our role, particularly, or my role, is to and support you in highlighting, supporting and developing best practice that informs policy, um, improving the understanding and engagement, as I sort of alluded to, between social prescribing practitioners, health prof professionals, funders, commissioners, to really understand the value that the voluntary sector is bringing around supporting health and well-being activities, social prescribing. Um, you know, to the rest of, of, of civil society. And we're very keen to represent the voice of service users, patients and carers. So the next slide, please. So our focus, um, just a little bit. So when I started, we had um, 169 members and we've just and over the last four months managed to increase that to 20%. So we're constantly growing all the time. We're particularly interested in working with health watchers. So that's ironic, Mike. We'll probably be contacting you to see if you want to join. Um, and um, faith groups as well. We, we haven't got many faith groups. We know particularly in mosques and uh, you know, synagogues are, are delivering really important activity and working with those communities that, that the NHS keeps on pointing out they can't really reach as well. And we're really well based, um, really well placed to do that. And we'll connect people together. We do that through um, running quarterly webinars for, for, for um, members. We ran, we ran a couple recently around the importance of thinking about inclusivity when you think about practice and anyone can join that who's a member um, or anyone outside who wants to attend as well, but specifically members find out about these things. Um, to, to help support link workers in their practice and generally the voluntary sector to help sort of say what it was that they thought was useful. We've also um, run one on um, intersectionality, which is a big, big thing that people are talking about to try and explain to people what that means in the context of social prescribing. And we've just put a blog up today that's just gone live all about that, which also gives some top tips. We have a monthly newsletter that we, we put out for the sector, which has a lot of different um, highlights, funding opportunities, resources for best practice, particularly across London. We encourage members to contribute. And um, obviously we, we've also just highlighted um, how to, we, we've created an area where you can put referrals. Um, so people can actually advertise, which I know might sound a bit strange for the voluntary sector who are absolutely overwhelmed at the moment with, with need and really can't supply the demand. But we are aware of some, some organisations that requires those referrals to come through for their funding. So we've created an area on the newsletter where you can actually advertise if you need more people to come to your service. Um, we we'll also do case studies of best practice, and we've recently one done on done one on how to embed yourself as an organisation in a clinical pathway. We've given examples of um, health and well-being and activities like that. Uh, we quite often write blogs as well and give op-ed pieces. Um, again, over to our members who might want to talk about challenges or successes. With the case studies and the blogs, it's kind of an opportunity for people to maybe emulate what they're seeing as well and expand further. So I'm constantly on the lookout for those kind of things to help um, support our members' knowledge who are delivering social prescribing activities, but also to sort of take the bits that they might want to um, cherry pick from what other boroughs are doing because it's quite hard there's lots of different models of social prescribing activities that are happening across all the different boroughs in London so mapping those can be quite a challenge social prescribing comes under the area of food green 
social prescribing, which might be considered like gardening, outdoor activities, cultural activities, so the arts, well-being, physical health, so sports, mental health, which Michael's kind of mentioned. So there's a really range broad that we're trying to find all the time of what people are up to. And then obviously creating materials and resources for the sector. And this is all on our web pages and things. We have our own special web page for the social prescribing network. I'm just going to say a little bit about what our members have told us so far, and then I'm going to talk a bit about something called the Thriving Communities Program, which some of you may or may not have heard about. But I'm also the regional learning uh, regional coordinator for that program as well. So next slide, please. So um, this is what our members tell us, and it's really great to hear from Mike how helpful link workers are being for communities and, and people are finding that engagement really useful for them. What we're finding from our members, um, some of the positives that we're finding, particularly because of COVID-19 and the changes um, that, that perhaps are needing to happen in terms of referrals and things, that it really... The, the voluntary sector really feels that the NHS particularly are starting to recognise the value that they are bringing because after all they, they were able, due to the way we are very agile as a voluntary sector, to be able to respond very quickly um, with almost weekly in some cases to the changes that the COVID-19 brought in terms of getting food and medicine out to the voluntary sector. Uh, sorry, out to the community. So the NHS could really recognise it, and that's what that case study, um, which was why community voluntary action was all about, is how they managed to very quickly embed themselves in the clinical pathway, which then meant they had much more um, better conversations, strengthened their relationship with the commissioners, which is what a lot of voluntary sector organisations really want to do. And that's part of my role to support you to make that happen. There's been a positive change in those relationships. Um, and as, as I've sort of alluded to because of this and also with Greater London Authority being more aware of what the voluntary sector is doing as well and actually coming to us as London Plus as a connector for all of the voluntary sector who deliver social prescribing activities to connect those different individual organisations with them to talk to them about what they're doing. Um, however, some of the negatives which will only increase, I think, is there's real concern about how the referrals don't, the funding doesn't follow the referral pathway. And there's an assumption by the NHS, or seems to be, from what we're hearing from our members, is that um, a lot of those, that, that a lot of the funding that comes to the voluntary sector is coming from local authorities. And that's not strictly true. And I think there's going to be some really interesting conversations that need to take place if we really want social prescribing to be embedded as much as, as the healthcare NHS seem to want to, as much as say the, the, the um, London Mayor's office does and the other systems that are in place around sort of supporting health and wellbeing of our communities around commissioning. I think we really need to start thinking about how that commissioning works because I think what happens is a lot of commissioners just just um, commission those really big like age uk's or um you know men cap or the big ones that they know about mind and actually it's the smaller organizations that actually are delivering a lot of that really um they have the best links with those um communities that that the, the, the health really want us to reach but the funding isn't following that so there's a real concern about this constant referral and it's going to get can I say, it's going to get even more challenging because over the next six months, there's going to be 136 new link worker posts created across London, which only means that the, the demand is going to become even more. And there just isn't the, the support there and, and the, the, the activities and the ability for the voluntary sector to respond to what the demand is coming from of the link workers. So that's one of the watchwords I'd say that's coming back from our members and really we all need to come together as a system and we'll be working very closely with those organisations that I mentioned, those structures that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation to actually um, start having those dialogues, start challenging some of those views, start gathering the evidence as well about what's really happening. Where's the money? Where, where does the flow of money actually happen versus where people are assuming? And finding out directly from yourselves if you deliver social prescribing activities today 
Um, what, what, how are you being funded? Is it match funding? Is it coming from somewhere else? Is it coming from even within the own charity sector, you know, like London funders or someone like that? Well, again, that's that if that's the case, somewhere along the line, health needs to maybe consider changing how it commissions and funds this part of the work because effectively, and I feel very strongly about this, it feels like, you know, you've got a heart team and you've created these specialist surgeons and there's no services. That that's effectively what inadvertently the NHS seems to have done. And so there's a disconnect there between expectations of what the voluntary sector think are expected to meet in terms of what the link worker wants to prescribe to versus the reality. That's not to say that that, that the voluntary sector isn't meeting some of those um, prescriptions that are being given to them but just to say there is a real real pressure and it's only going to continue as as we move out of this lockdown phase two whatever we're calling it um particularly with all those new posts coming online the other one um is around mi the mismatch between link workers role and expectation and this is maybe something you know, obviously, Mike, you're, you're particularly there on the sharp end, but a lot of our members are sort of saying that link workers are prescribing an activity to people. And I thought it was really interesting and, and hugely, hugely encouraging that at least in your area, you're making it very clear that people have to be willing, able and capable of attending those activities. But what we're finding is a lot of those mental health needs are, are ending up in activities um, that really aren't appropriate for people. They should have gone to a mental health support, first of all, and the link workers just just basically, maybe possibly only looked at one part of someone's life. And, and from what Mike has very clearly said to us today, it's got to be a holistic thing. And that's really what social prescribing is supposed to be about. It's that conversation that the GP can't, doesn't have the time anymore really to have with a person. And that person gets a real chance to get a real sense from a link worker what they need and the link worker can then prescribe different parts of the system to that person but there seems to be a mismatch going on in some places that we'll need to support people around as well and then finally there's there's something around the project-based concerns that, that our members are telling us that everything sort of when it is being um when they are receiving money it's project based and that's not how people work. People don't need a project. They need to be able to have this need met and this need met and this need met. And the voluntary sector itself needs that infrastructure around it and that support in order to be able to respond to those needs as and when, you know, Joe blogs or, or, or Jane walks through the door and they can do that that way. And at the moment, if, it's, if that project doesn't necessarily work for that person, then that that they're not able to support the communities in the way they'd like to. So that's kind of hopefully gives you a bit of an overview of what the social prescribing network is and what our role is across the sector and where we fit in. Um, I'm just going to go into the thriving communities. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and as I said, I'm the regional coordinator for the London Thriving Communities uh, program. I'm gonna to explain to you a bit about how that's come about, what the focus is of the organization, which is the National Academy of Social Prescribing. And then I'm actually gonna to explain to you how we in London Plus, in view of how we see our role, have actually, what, what structure we've kind of created to enable this, this program to work across London around social prescribing. So if I could have the next slide, please. So basically, this part of the work is funded by National Academy of Social Prescribing. And the National Academy of Social Prescribing, as it says, is, is a big national organisation that was launched by Matt Hancock 2019 last year. So very quickly, obviously, it didn't take them long, you know, six months in, they were having to deal with everyone was having to deal with the change in, in what was happening across the whole of the country, if not the world. Their role is to basically create partnerships across all those different areas that I mentioned. Um, 
uh, to promote the health and well-being. So basically, it's sort of shorthand for social prescribing, you could argue. And particularly around championing at a national level and a strategic level, the work of local communities and what they're doing around social prescribing. So these seven regions that are taking place, London's one, there's the Southeast, Northwest, Northeast, you know, fill in the gaps there. Next slide, please. What their particular focus is for the next three years is um, they've put together a strategic plan and I've put the link there. Um, B's presentation will be sent around afterwards. So it's a live link. So you can click on it and see if you're interested in finding out more about what NASP do, the National uh, so Academy for Social Prescribing. They've launched the Thriving Communities Program that was launched October this year. So it's only really been running for a couple of, um, of months. And um, they've, they're going to create an academic partners collaborative and partnership with South Bank Centre. This just gives you, next slide please. This just gives you a quick overview of what the Thriving Communities Program is. There's like four strands to it. Um, the Thriving Communities Network, which is going to basically be a, um, an online network, an ideas hub, which you can just join and uh, pr put any content in, learning together, which you need to apply for, which has now got extended. And that's for small organizations who want to attend workshops around partnerships and connect together. And that's got extended to the 24th of um, Jan, we've just found out. And then there's some funding, which is the NHS Charities Together and the Thriving Communities Fund which um, closes on the 8th of Jan. So if anyone wants to find out about that, they can contact me separately. I'm just gonna finish by saying um, the next slide, please. And this basically explains very quickly what we've done. So rather than London Plus deliver this, we've got five areas, which are on the following slides, which I won't go through, of different parts of London that are that are covering this part of the program for us because we don't deliver anything. So we've given the majority of the money that we've got, apart from our management costs, have gone to, into the voluntary sector to deliver this program. Um, and there's the details there of the people you want to contact within your own boroughs over the next couple of slides if you want to find out more about that or you've got an idea for social prescribing project that you want to tell people about. And final slide, thank you at the end. Um, those are my contact details and uh, that is um, where I'll finish. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for that, um, Stephanie. A lot of really useful information in that and um, some great questions starting to appear in the chat and the question and answer box. And can I please remind people because there are some really great questions coming up in the chat, but if you don't put them in the Q&A box, we may lose them. So please put them there. But thank you so much again, Stephanie. And um, we have, as I said, got the question and answer afterwards. So please hold on. Thank you. Gotcha. Okay, so um, we're going to move swiftly on to Richard Ings. So welcome, Richard. Um, hi. And hi, Richard. And uh, R Richard is from Arts Council England. And Richard, I'm going to hand over to you so that you can tell people about um, how the Arts Council is involved with social prescribing. Thank you. Great, thank you. And thanks for inviting me to this. And uh, uh, good to be able to have the opportunity to talk about. Um, can you hear me? No. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. I, I've had a, a difficult experience with a couple of Zoom conferences where I've suddenly gone gone still and carried on for about ten minutes. If that does happen, I will I will circulate the um, or I'll ask uh, to to circulate my presentation. Um, I'm just thinking uh, that, as Stephanie said, this work has been ha happening for uh, quite some time. It's not brand new. Some GPs have been doing it for for uh, fifteen twenty years. Um, ten years ago. I, the last piece of work I did before during the Arts Council was for the Arts Council, and it was looking at um, Be Creative, Be Well, which is a London-wide initiative, uh, part of a Well London, a, a bigger Well London project that involved a number of different agencies, youth agency, gardening, and so on. 
and it was uh, aimed at bringing arts and cultural activities, youth activities, gardening activities, and so on, to some of the poorest uh, neighbourhoods in in London. And uh, in a way, it was it was uh, a kind of social prescribing uh, before that was really uh, before it became the thing it is today. Uh, about what it goes back to is how to address the inequalities in our society, um, health inequalities, social inequalities, and indeed cultural inequalities as well. So, um, and I think a, a lot of the agencies involved in this are very much concerned with um, those inequalities and addressing them through through the various programmes. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the community, uh, Thriving Communities uh, programme in a minute. I've got a I've got a rather long uh, presentation to share with you, which I shall whiz through. Um, just to say that uh, I, I, if there are questions at the end uh, and that I can't answer, I will hope that they can be gathered together and we, and we can add them to our frequently asked questions, um, which uh, I can give you a link for. Um, so as Stephanie also said, and as clear from Mike's presentation, this whole area has, has boomed. Um, through this unfortunate pandemic we're all living through. And Bromley by Bose Centre, uh, which has been mentioned, uh, as, is a pioneering um, agency in the field. And they were telling me they did um, more assessments and referrals, if you like, um, in the first three months than the entire previous year. A number of some cultural organisations have also uh, moved much more in this direction, sending out packs, um, contacting people digitally or by phone and so on. And um, what's really been exciting about, um, particularly about the Thriving Communities Fund, because it, it kind of represents this cross-agency working, which is so vital to make social prescribing work. So we talk about cultural social prescribing, but we recognize arts and culture are part of the voluntary sector, and that we are looking uh, and we're hoping for partnerships between um, environmental uh, charities, um, finance charities, and so on, so that we all work together to provide the kind of holistic personalized care that the NHS is hoping for from social prescribing. I hope I'm still being heard. Am I still being heard? Yeah, you are. Yes, I'll, you know, right. issues. I'll share my screen now, see if this works, because I'm going to do this myself if I can. And there we are. Uh, and can you, if I do this from the beginning, it's always a good place to start. Okay, great. Um, can you see that, everybody? Yeah, looks good. Great. Yes, you can. Right. Yes. Um, it's, it's lovely, these, these meetings, aren't they? Because everyone's on mute and <laughs> you might be speaking into the void. Um, as you'll see here, um, I am the London Area Champion. Sounds very grand, doesn't it? London Area Champion for Arts and Health, Wellbeing and Criminal Justice. That, I mean, I'm one of a number uh, of champions the Arts Council uh, nationally that are focusing um, part of their time on this work uh, alongside their, their core job of uh, looking after the cultural sector. At the bottom there you'll see John McArts and John McMahon is our um, national lead on this work and he's, uh, I'm, not, I'm not great on Twitter, he is, so he's a great one to follow um, if, if you are on Twitter yourself, John McArts, you'll you get all the latest information on his feed. So, um, just a little bit about who we are. And I think it's interesting um, to point out here that the Thriving Communities Fund is a cross agency, but it's being administered by um, the Arts Council. And all applications should include, it should, all applications to the fund would include um, organizations from across these various parts of the voluntary sector, but must include arts and culture. Um, amongst them. So if you're not familiar with the, what the Arts Council is, we are the Arts and Cultural Development Agency in England. We've got an annual budget which looks very big but doesn't go terribly far given the need. Uh, we cover a whole range of things here, um, if, things that aren't mentioned here like, like circus and live art and, and all kinds of creative activities. We also cover museums uh, and uh, the, art, the cultural work that happens in libraries as well. So that gives you an idea of our reach across the country. 829 national portfolio organisations, and those are organisations that get longer funding from us. Um, and many of these are beginning, if they hadn't been already, they, 
uh, begun to do a lot more work in in this area and reaching out uh, uh, to their local communities and um, pursuing a, a, their civic role, if you like. Project grants um, are open, a national lottery funded, so they're open to anybody wanting to do something creative in England, um, and that might be something around social prescribing. Um, yeah, okay, well, let's, we've got a lot to get through, so let's, but let's look specifically at arts, and, and it's worth saying that we have, as we have in criminal justice work as well, we've always supported kind of work, and that project I was involved in uh, uh, over 10 years ago, um, Be Creative, Be Well, was just um, the latest at that point of, of a number of initiatives, but probably the most exciting initiative up to that point. And it was around this time that we had this statement from the Secretary of State for Health. Culture is not some concentric on, it should be part of the mainstream in both health and social care. Ten years later, after the big crash, there's still that feeling. Um, Matthew Hancock's been a great champion of arts and culture and uh, the voluntary sector in delivering social prescribing. It, the National Academy is in many ways his baby and he's, uh, he's fought to have that established. Um, but he makes the point here, which is good to hear from a government minister, we should value the arts and social activities because they're essential to our health and well-being. And as I think Mike was mentioning, um, the the GPs, um, the, the front line, if you like, uh, of our health um, care system, um, one in five uh, of uh, appointments with GPs, um, it won't result in a, in a medical diagnosis as such. It, or it won't result in a, a delivery of medicine or antibiotics. It will be to do something to do with mental health or loneliness, um, sort of economic problems, some physical health problems as well. We've got uh, an, an aging population um, and with long-term conditions, which again, like dementia, the various forms of dementia and uh, musculoskeletal problems, for which there isn't really a, a medical uh, cure as such, but which can be alleviated and addressed through um, arts and culture and sporting and events, other activities. I mean. So this is something I've involved in uh, um, prior to our new strategy, which is a, a summary of the impact or the evidence for the impact of arts and health on, on, on arts and culture, on, on health and well-being. And that's on our website. Again, we can, um, I can supply that link. Um, and there have been a, a, a whole slew of different sort of gathering a mountain of, of evidence and advocacy for this work. Um, perhaps the most significant uh, was initiated by the All Party Parliamentary Group for Arts, Health and Wellbeing in 2017, which produced a very good report, Creative Health, quite a big one, but a very real one with lots of evidence, lots of uh, case studies, stories, and looking at how arts and culture can play a part of, the, uh, part of every stage of life, basically, from birth through to um, palliative care. And there's another list of, of other things that have come out. So as, I, as I say, I'll be able to share these slides later. Uh, but if you're interested, you can find out a bit more context of the work. So at the moment, uh, this is a, a, a summary of what we're investing in this area. And it's, as you'll see in a, in a moment, it's, it's, a, it's a growth area for us, as, as it is, I think, more generally out in the cultural sector as people are responding to, to real social and health need. I'll just let you read that for a moment. Um, part way down that page is the mention of the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance, which some of you may know. Um, this is a sector support organisation that um, serves those arts and cultural organisations delivering uh, activities for health and wellbeing. Uh, they do a tremendous, uh, a, a fantastic website uh, to, to read. Um, lots of um, surveys of what's happening during COVID as well. It's been excellent work there. And here's a, here's a sort of give you a sense of the that increase, as I mentioned, in uh, investment. Um, in 2018, so it goes uh, from the bottom up, if you like. 100, that 162, that first figure refers to projects. So we funded 162 health and wellbeing projects uh, 20, you know, five years ago and spent two, three million. 
we look right to now, it's, it's, it's triple 19 um, projects and about five or six times the amount of investment, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, and it should be that is a main fund programs rather than any special strategic funding um, like thriving communities. So I was asked to talk a little bit about our work with the NHS more generally. And we are here's an indication of the various agencies, and as you, some of you may know, health is full of full of acronyms and organisations. Um, with each of these, we we're developing uh, different things. With then England, um, agents interest which is them in subscribing and been on the map board for the National Academy for Social Prescribing. Um, we're doing a GP training pilot with Health Education England, uh, we're working with Public Health England on Every Mind Matters, um, local government association, the all part of parliamentary. And they continue to look at specific aspects of uh, and health and well-being. I hope my internet connection is unstable, it says to me. I always take that very personally, but I'm hoping I'm still being heard. Uh, we're also to sit uh, um, when we can on research network meetings. So the Royal Society for Public Health, an independent body that interested in the evidence base, because there still is um, a, a, a work to be done to, to make it clear what and culture and what's and what all these uh, all bring something something slightly different um, uh, um, but it's not always recognized that um, arts and culture um, is is uh, valid in this in this area of work um, despite many years of practice so that report I, I mentioned earlier and so on, and our consultation with the cultural sector and local authorities, etc., 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 has resulted in a new 10 year strategy, uh, Let's Create, uh, which has moved much more strongly towards um, uh, our previous, our previous um, strategy. Um, Richard, was for, yes? Richard, just to interrupt you really quickly. Um, yes, of course. If we stop the video, it might have it might speed up your internet a bit. So if we just have your voice and the slides, is that okay? Uh, you want me to cut my video off? Yes. Yeah, it will make it a bit faster, I think. Uh, okay. That's clever. No, I've, I've lost where I am here. Hang on. Uh, hang if on. you bring the slide back up, I can stop your video. But just if you stay as you were. Yeah. Um, yes, I can't reach my. Um, should I stop sharing? Or? You could stop sharing and then bring it back as you did before. That's screen sharing. Oh, hang on, hang on. Hang on. Uh, stop video. There. I found it. Um, So you can see what at the moment? We can see your slides. You just need to put it on full screen, please. Okay. Are we there? Back again. Sorry about We're that. Good. Is that better? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that technical support. Um, so our last strategy was called Achieving Great Art and Culture for Everyone. And I suppose what we've moved more towards is the everyone bit of that last um, strategy as, as we um, recognize that historically our funding hasn't um, reached um, the widest possible constituency, if you like. And there's been a gradual move towards this for some time. Um, we've run programs like uh, Creative People and Places, which are very much grassroots based. Um, so, for example, we've moved from the days when a theatre would say, come and see our play. Um, and here's some incentives to come and see our play. Then we would take the play out as outreach, if you like, and, and tour it. Uh, but now we're saying, 
here we've got some resources, theatre resources. What do you want to do with them? Let's make something together. And there's a lot of these co-words being talked about in the cultural sector now, co-creation, co-design. And a recognition as well that what we fund hasn't been uh, hasn't reached as a diverse community as it should. Um, and we've had the creative case for diversity, which has been uh, trying to encourage the people we fund, particularly those on a long term basis, to uh, ensure that their programmes um, and their workforce represent, reflect the society we all live in. Uh, we're moving much more strongly in that direction with this new um, with this new strategy. So you know, I am taking a rather long time with this. So, but just to say, we would have had by now, had the pandemic not happened, we would have had a delivery plan which would put some flesh on the bones of Let's Create. Um, as it stands, it will be published, uh, we hope, at the latest in early March next year. Um, uh, but even at that sort of top level of the of the statement of the of the strategy itself, the, the top level line. It does talk about healthcare providers, charities in the voluntary sector. It does talk about getting involved in creative activities and communities, reducing loneliness, physical supporting physical physical and mental health and well-being. Uh, we've done a lot of work over the past with the Bearing Foundation around older people, which will carry on, uh, as well as with children and young people. Um, we're working with healthcare providers, as you've seen. Um, and we're looking at the evidence and looking to help grow the evidence uh, that culture, arts and cultural activity can lead to improved health and well-being and to develop these partnerships that I mentioned already, um, social care as well as health. And we actually do talk about social describing in the in the 10 year strategy. So that's we're very much committed to it. And there are this is just to show that there are um, other organisations um, support organisations around the country uh, supporting this work. We have one in London, which is where I'm based, a London Arts and Health Forum. Um, we work very closely together with the GLA and Healthy London Partnership, um, which Stephanie mentioned. So very quickly now, because I think I've probably taken up far too much time, but the Thriving Communities Fund, uh, which Stephanie talked about, um, comes out of the National Academy for Social Prescribing. It's more than that fund. There's a, there's a network, webinars, action learning sets. So it's something that's worth visiting. Um, and it, certainly that, that website will grow um, uh, with case studies, things that can be um, learned from. Uh, because we're still, although it's been going in some ways at grassroots level in some parts of the country for some time, it's only now really that it's becoming a national offer and so we're still in very early days and there's been a lot of talk already from speakers about um the need to join up um and and um i think that's that's really crucial both at a, a top level strategic level if you like but certainly at the, on the ground level because that's the only place it's the social prescribing is actually going to be able to work if people work well together on the ground and, and create partnerships and that's really as Steph said what Stephanie said uh, what Thriving Communities program is trying to encourage is those sort of partnerships um, so that's a little bit of information I'll give you the links all this stuff is on the website including I did have a look at the, uh, the frequently asked questions about this fund I think I'll, I'll bone up on this in case I'm asked, you know, a question I can't immediately answer. And it's 19 pages long, so I haven't really absorbed all that. But uh, it does suggest there's a lot of questions are being answered on the website. So you may find that if I can't answer some today, you can find it there. Um, and that's the that's the um, link at the bottom there. Um, it'll have a, um, all the information you really need. Um, so the grants of between 25 and 50,000 um, distribution across the country, across the seven NHS England regions. And as, I've been, as we've been saying, it's, it is a cross agency uh, fund that Arts Council is uh, administering and that London Plus is, is uh, helping to deliver. Um, the place based partnerships, as we've just said, uh, this has got to happen locally if it's going to happen at all and certainly a lot of our funding the arts council is as we go forward and we're looking at our delivery plan now place-based work is really important um and it gives our mainstream organizations if you want to call them that the chance to really think about the communities they live in 
and how they might con uh, connect more with them. So I'll just let you, you read that. And I think an important, really important bullet point at the end there is the priority audience is on those people and communities most subject to health inequalities and most likely to be negatively affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. I think it's a really important point. Um, who will deliver? Every project needs a letter of support from a local social prescribing link worker, which goes back to um, the, the people that Mike um, has been talking about, which is vital because one of the big questions uh, at the beginning of all of this was, okay, you've got the person prescribing, you've got the person being prescribed to, um, the link worker uh, is funded by the NHS, so that's working, but who is funding the activities that are being prescribed? And that's uh, that has, has been raised earlier is still still a question, which Thrive Communities Fund is trying to address. Um, I should say here, I'm not going to leave, leave a link to it as well, is that there are, two, there are prior to the launch of Thriving Communities, um, we in London and also in Calderdale have launched um, so, uh, social prescribing pilots to try and learn what the practical challenges and achievements uh, are uh, if, you, if you try this. So we've appointed in London, which is the one I'm close to, we've appointed six cultural organisations to work in two London boroughs around arts and mental health. And they're sort of, they've begun their activities now, it's obviously delays because of the pandemic, uh, but already some interesting things are coming out about the challenges and also about the things that are beginning to work. Um, and a lot of it comes down to how do the referrals work? How do we form relationships? How do we form partnerships? How do we make each other un understood to each other? There's a lot of translation going on between our different agendas and languages and acronyms. And that. Um, so those are all the different organizations that could lead applications they don't have to be led by arts and culture they could be led by any any of these um sectors within the voluntary sector um i think steph said the the the, the deadline has been extended i didn't know that if that's the case at the moment i'm saying 8th of january there but i think she might have said the 24th anyway um these are the main uh main funds that i mentioned earlier uh, for which there may be uh, opportunities to support social prescribing. Um, it has to take its, um, take its chances against every other project that wants to do something artistic in England. But nevertheless, this is a real growing area of interest and need. Developing your creative practice is aimed at individual practitioners and artists, cultural workers. Um, and what has that, that has been about historically, really, it's been about a step change in an artist's career. And that step change, I think, could be, well, I can extend my portfolio, I can do some work in a healthcare setting, or I can go and work with a group with um, a dementia or whatever it might be. So there might be a, a, a real opportunity there for artists, individual practitioners that are very experienced in running um, engagement activities in the arts. They could apply that um, to a kind of social prescribing um, area of work. So that's, thank you. And that's, that's just some sort of practical things. So, I, um, Eileen, I did send through some other uh, links to some of the things I've been talking about. Do you want me to post them in the chat or have you gotten to post in? Um, I haven't got those, unfortunately, Richard. I've put in the ones that were on your slide, but I haven't got the others. If you could okay, uh, I'll, pop them I'll in the chat, you. that would be fantastic. And I'll, I'll put them in the chat, shall I, just to be sure? Yeah, put them in the chat or you can actually, why don't you put them in the, in our um, box and then um, we can make sure that um, people get those. Yeah. Well, Wonderful. send them to you direct. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation, Richard. Um, there's an awful lot of information in there. Um, and again, some opportunities worth exploring with regards to ways that um, you can use different funding streams that Arts Council are currently um, distributing. So that will be useful for those of you out there who work in the arts and cultural sector. Um, we're going to move on now to um, talk to Barbara and Vernon. So can I welcome you both um, to um, talk a little bit about, um, they're from the Belen Network and they are going to talk about um, what they've been doing around social prescribing. So um, can I welcome you guys? Can you join us? 
Barbara and Patrick. Lovely, things are moving. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much to both of you for coming on board. And um, it'd be really useful if we can start maybe um, by introducing yourself, the organisations you're working and how and why social prescribing. Um, who wants to go up first? I don't mind going first. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, yeah. Uh, my name's Barbara Gray and um, I'm CEO of um, a social enterprise called Urban Dandelion. And I'm based in Catford in, in Lewisham. And um, what I have been doing, my focus, and I'm also the um, BAME Health and Equalities Advisor to the Mayor of Lewisham. I've been um, commissioned to do that work for him last year and um, asked to do it again this year. So social prescribing uh, is something that I have, have been involved in. Um, for decades, I've got to say. Um, so when I see it described in here, what's going on, I think, well, this is what I've been doing for a long, long time um, in the context of economic development, regeneration, placemaking, um, uh, community development. All of these things have brought people together to bring about changes that affect them and that ultimately improve their health and well-being. Because there's always a connection and it's always been Public health have been around the table with police, housing associations, you name it. Um, and a lot of signposting goes on because people don't know about each other uh, and pieces of work emerge. That means that the communities in those localities are coming together, solving issues, um, and a lot of the time dealing with their health and outcomes. But more specifically from um, Urban Dandelion, what I have been doing um, for the last three years in particular is focusing on health inequalities and um, realised that from the stats that the statutory health services just weren't meeting the need. And in fact, uh, the bank communities just weren't even going. They weren't going to the GPs, weren't going to appointments. Mm -hmm. So it's a way of trying to raise awareness of the extent of the of, of health in compared to everybody else and trying to link it to cultural activities, A, to engage them um, and to give them the information. So I team up with all kinds of people doing things around healthy eating and linking it to Caribbean food, quadrille dance workshops, you, know, you name it, anything that was gonna attract people's attention, we'd find people that could put those sessions on and give the health message through that. Um, and then through that work, we'd start to get the attention of the public health department and other, other people to see what it was that we were doing. And most recently, um, Urban Dandelion has put on a program of healthy walks in our local park that's linked to um, a, a national program by the Ramblers Association. And we linked up with a GP who was quite um, interested and she was a, a black GP herself. Uh, we ended up getting um, a membership and taking people to um, Kew Gardens to extend the walk beyond our local park. Uh, reminiscent sessions and, and, I, and then we had people being referred to that walk because it was BAME led and it seemed to attract um, mainly African and, and Caribbean um, elders who came along to that with their, with their family members, uh, grandchildren, nephews, nieces and children. Uh, reminiscent session, again, that's something that's, that's been run by Urban Dandelion for um, at least three years in the local library um, and um, social prescribers would regularly bring people and link workers to the session to come and see if it was something that they may like. And uh, well, there was one woman, she was from St. Lucia, who's been there for two years. Um, and it was uh, one of her two um, times out of her house to do something, mm. to make it relevant. Um, a hot meal delivery service, and that was an emergency response programme where uh, we were providing, tele it's a group of six BAME-led organisations providing telephone befriending, virtual group sessions and a hot meal delivery service of African Caribbean and Asian meals. And we just got swamped hundreds and hundreds of, of phone calls for 60 places um, being run by six people. Um, and um, referrals included, I had so many link workers contact me, community connection workers, the emergency um, telephone people for that service. Um, so in terms so so in terms of my um, experience with with um, social prescribing is that I you know 
I'm experienced in working with it. I've worked with lots of organizations and linked with lots of organizations who've been doing it for a long time. Uh, I think the one thing, and I didn't want to come on and, and sound whining, but really it was really interesting to the early uh, speakers because what it showed was the money is definitely not following those people. Mm. All of that work that was done was done voluntary, all of it. Mm. Nobody has been paid, no one. Um, and and, and, I, and when I heard about social prescribing and thinking, well, this is great because people do love the services. We're always full of people who want to come and particularly vain people who will not go to anything else but nobody's getting paid for it. So how do you sustain something? Because there is a cost in putting these issues on. And I think if that could be raised by London Plus, that would be absolutely marvellous because that is something that's being missed, particularly in a borough like Lewisham, where it has the third largest Caribbean population um, in, in, in England. And, um, and, and that a large majority of that is the Windrush generation. So, you know, their health outcomes aren't good. They're not accessing services. And this is kind of a, a pathway to it. And just finally, because of time, what I've done um, as a result of this um, hot meals delivery service and telephone befriending that was totally swamped uh, because the mainstream services hadn't thought about, you know, the cultural needs in providing the service. And I suppose when you're doing things, you just do what's quick and easy. Um, but as a result of that, we're creating, I've got some funding, uh, Wave 3 funding to create a BAME infrastructure stroke funding hub in Lersham to bring together all of those organisations under a formal structural organisations to try and do. And what I see is the work of both the previous speakers. So London Plus, I must definitely need to be a membership of yours on all the work that you're doing is what we are doing, but bringing it together formally. And also for the Arts Council and for a borough like Lewisham, where we are going to be the borough of culture next year. My work at the moment is trying to encourage the artists um, that exist and all the cultural work amongst the BAME organisations of which there are many to be part of it, but they need funding and there isn't enough. So I'm hoping that the Arts Council will still favour applications from Lewisham and find a way of enabling BAME organisations to be part of that. We try to support them so that they can put in applications and pass due diligence and all of those things but a barrier is the application process. So if somebody somewhere is, is from the Arts Council can think about how BAME organisations can put in for applications to do that. And finally, finally, it's just how we can use art as a way of, there's an organisation that does immersive art um, and, and the issues are raised through the community and it's used to create a script and it puts on a performance which everybody takes part in and it raises issues around access to health and well-being service and the barriers or particular health issues and um, to identify what the issues are through participation with the audience. It's very difficult to get health to embrace it. Uh, and, it and, and I'd like to think that that's the sort of thing we could put in the funding for from the Arts Council funding. So we're doing a lot. We're really doing a lot. But the real issue for us is that when I hear that a small organisation is an, an organisation that gets a million pounds, and we've got people who are happy if they get 200, which is so far off the mark. But yet, in the, um, we're really doing a lot of work for to address the health inequalities that have been identified through all the reports that have been produced during COVID impact, but we're just nowhere near or not part of, of, of social prescribing or being considered. Um, and, and we really are ready. We just need to be able to be part of that ecosystem. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you very much. Um, Patrick, over to you. Why okay. social prescribing? Yeah, hi, good afternoon, everyone. It's really great to be on this call. Uh, I've been involved in social prescribing for many years. Um, it wasn't called social prescribing at the time, but it was. Um, so if I go back to when I used to work for the NHS, uh, I used to be a director of what was then called Health Action Zones. If anyone can remember that. Okay, yeah. There were 26 health action zones down the country. Yeah. And they actually were the ones starting to fund some of the early thinking around social prescribing. So I was a director in Brent and I actually commissioned the CAB service to do stuff around welfare rights, provision, GP surgeries. And there were quite a few health action zones and other organisations doing that. Then on the Stonebridge Estate, um, not far from Harleston, we commissioned projects working with GPs and communities around exercise by prescription. Um, and then in other parts of my career, 
um, I work for the National Housing Federation and a lot of housing associations, a number of housing associations, particularly in North of England, were, had a project called um, Boiler by Prescription, whereby if your heating system broke down, you, you, you get a referral from the GP and it goes straight to the repairs and maintenance team as well. So there have been lots of examples around using the model of engaging frontline GP and primary care services around uh, health, around exercise, welfare rights, etc. Uh, but the area I've been really interested in around the whole stuff around social prescribing has been around, uh, particularly around mental health and arts and culture. And because well, I worked in mental health services for a number of years, also I was a core fellow and I did a lot of work as a core fellow looking at art, identity and belonging. And, um, and I've tried to, through my various jobs I've had, to try and set some of this, this work out. So for example, um, I, I used to be the director of Black Thrive in Lambeth. And uh, one of the things I did, I organized a number of conversations with um, the Black Culture Archives uh, over house and uh, a lot of black art practitioners to explore the issue of what does social prescribing mean in the context of uh, black culture and identity if you want to influence primary care and, and, as, and some aspects of secondary care uh, mental health services. Um, I mean, and there's been a long history of commissioning of arts and well-being services around social prescribing. So as a core fellow, one, one, uh, how I got to know about, about this whole world was through uh, a project um, run by Philip Cortho, called Gavin Clayton, uh, who has played a key role nationally uh, around making the case for arts and well-being commissioning. Um, they got commissioned by in Cambridgeshire by their local primary care trust and CCG to do a pro, uh, social prescribing program looking at arts and well-being, where they would work with people with mental health problems, get referral from GP surgeries, and they had an eight-week program. They'd go to theatre, they'd do a still, a still classes, they would explore arts and well-being as part of their therapy. And then they got London School of Economics to do uh, an external evaluation. And they worked out that, um, that they saved the NHS locally £1 million, because yeah. normally they would be, they'd be it's more cost effective than them going through uh, IAP or CBT or any kind of counter service, even though we know it's difficult to get hold of that anyway. But it was actually cheaper and it, and it was more grounded for them as well. So I wanted to adopt that model in Lambeth when I was director of Blackpool. Could we do something similar? And we, have, we had a series of conversations. And one of the things, I mean, it's, just, it's interesting to hear the conversations that we've heard so far around social prescribing, but let's get real, guys. The relationship between the funding of black-led and BME organisations, uh, we know disproportionately, has not been in our favour for many years. And since austerity has got worse, basically, we've had a little bit of reprieve um, due to COVID. And that's only because of the work of Yubele and white uh, charities so white have been campaigning and, ex and exposing the inequalities and structural racism in the funding of mainstream funders and philanthropists. And, and then because of Black Lives Matter, that's, poor, that's made it even more the case. And that's why now all of a sudden people are interested in funding black stuff. Let's see how, how long that will continue. That's the first thing. The second thing we have to look at, uh, I'm into cultural history, and we have to look at the legacy of enslavement and the legacy of empire. And that has influence particularly when it comes to thinking. So there's been lots of creativity within the African, Caribbean, Southeast Asian communities and other communities for many decades, creatively um, around social prescribing. We didn't call it social, social prescribing. It was linking the community with uh, primary care or frontline or mainstream services. But when you create, when you have a new topic like social prescribing and everyone is seen as a new nirvana around uh, health and integration, and we get left, and we get we get left out of that. So one of the key things which I'm interested, I know it's I've seen some things in the chat, is how much of all these social prescribing projects that have been funded to date over the last five years have been funding and directly BME led organisations. That is a big question that we would need to know, and I, I probably got a fair idea that it's probably not many, and I can tell you the reasons why, especially in the context of arts and well-being. 
um, there's negativity still about blackness and being in communities and, and anything that is new and fangled around thinking, around social change, we always get the last crumbs at the very end. So when social prescribing will probably come to an, a natural end or become a new creation of another thinking around commissioning, the social prescribing is another mo- it's a new model around commissioning, that's all it is. Um, then we get, then we, by the time we get the money, it, it, everyone's moved on to another thinking around social, around, around commissioning. Um, in terms of the arts and mental health side of things, which I'm really interested in, there's still, there's, there's, if you look over the last 25 years in Britain, there has been a massive decimation of the black mental health sector. And it started back in the 1990s for the National Service Framework, which tried to then create um, uh, um, standardized ways of commissioning models for mental health services. This had a disproportionate impact particularly on black-led services, um, because there were loads of matters mental health services run by community organisations. majority of them now don't exist, or they've been run by housing associations or other mainstream providers. So when you talk about the whole concept of social prescribing, we're not benefiting from that because we've lost those organisations that could have done that kind of work. And the new organisation, as Barbara explained what, what she's trying to do in Lucian, then, you, then you've got organisations which are trying to get enough resources to provide often call services, but without the proper support and funding um, is uh, available. And that's why social, inf- that's why black-led infrastructure support is really critical. If we can then, then we can talk about social prescribing in a meaningful you. way. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think, um, I think um, you know, the fact that there have been so many organisations that have been well-established over the years, we've seen the waves come and go. And I think you're, you're all very, very correct in saying that it's been around for a while. It's just called something slightly different. Um, so I think, I think that's, you know, that has great value there. Um, I'm, I'm really aware of the time and I want to make sure that we get the opportunity uh, for, for, for people to, to ask some of these questions. We've got a few questions in the Q&A section. Um, so maybe if you could all come back into the room um, and then thank you very much, Patrick and Barbara, for that. Really, really appreciate that because I think you raised some really key on the ground questions about how does social prescribing really benefit us, particularly um, when there is a, a push towards um, targeting social prescribing at organizations, at, at individuals who um, are most at risk of, of poor health outcomes. And um, certainly the, 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 the black community is often in that um, bracket. And so how is it that um, we are going to make sure that the funding does come to organizations who are working with these communities to really um, make sure that they benefit from these schemes. So um, I'm gonna firstly um, start by looking at some of the questions that we have. Um, uh, it's the one of the first questions we have is from Jackie uh, Falconer. And again, please, um, anyone take the question um, if you feel it's the most relevant to you. Um, it says, is there a list of questions social, um, social prescribers ask? Um, anybody want to take that one? Yeah, I can, I can pick that up. Yes, there is. There's, um, there's a checklist, if you like, or an introduction script um, that we, we start. Um, but they, the emphasis is on getting feedback from the person, so we don't sort of overdo it, um, so it's not a long script. Um, so the questions re- are really are about what's, it, what's important to them, you know, what are the issues for you, Why, what can we do to help you, that's, that's basically it, um, and what are, the, what are your two main priorities, um, that's, that's where we start. Right, thank you. And again, I think um, this next question follows on from some of the stuff that Barbara and Patrick were talking about. Um, the question is, in which way can social prescribing help to reduce health in- inequity? Who wants to take that? Well, I can have a go to kick off. I mean, um, I think most of the people who are referred to us are those who you would say um, are suffering from health inequality. So they're, the, they're the really the focus of our, um, our service. Um, most of the activity is in Tottenham in the east of the borough, which is the poorer part. 
Um, Haringey, like quite a few London boroughs, has got a, a fairly rich bit, which is the Muswell Hill and Crouch End on the west, and then the east bit, which is more deprived. So most of our activity comes from the east. So I, I guess, you know, that focus 90% of what we do in social prescribing is around trying to um, rebalance and mitigate, never solve it, but mitigate health inequality. Mm. I mean, Barbara raised a really important question as well, is that, you know, she's saying that a lot of um, the BAME community aren't necessarily using mainstream services. So they may never get in front of a, a, a link worker or a social prescriber or even to their GP that could then refer them on. So what I wonder, um, and again, Stephanie, um, you it, through London Plus were talking about supporting um, organization, community organizations. What work, um, if any, is London Plus doing to really look at that issue? We're starting to do that work now as we're kind of, part of the problem we've got at the moment is we're trying to do, um, well, not problem, but, you know, when I've looked at, when I've come into the job and looked at who the members are, there's, there's a paucity of, of black community involvement. So, so we're actually trying to have, you know, pick up the phone and talk to people and starting particularly with faith groups because we know those are probably the places where people are less likely. And we're doing quite a lot of work with them at the moment. I, I'll, I'll be frank and say at this point, we haven't necessarily had that many people wanting to join the network. So we need to go back and find out what it is about, what we're talking to them about that isn't resonating. And I might come to yourself, Barbara and Patrick to have that conversation about it. So we are aware that there's a gap there and we're very keen to constantly, when we talk to the GLA, when we talk to HLP, when we talk to you know, um, anyone from the NHS to say, you keep on talking about the groups that are most likely to be hit. And those are the groups that the voluntary sector can reach. So you really need to be thinking about, you know, we, again, where you're putting the money really for this. And we are, we, we quite often do a lot of funding sort of when funding comes through as well through our newsletter, particularly for, for black communities. So we're just starting that work really around it. And there's a lot more work to be done, but we are really, really keen to, to engage more effectively with those groups and organizations who are working directly with black and minority ethnic communities and refugees. We actually ran a migrant and refugee population, population, migrant and refugee webinar back in October, trying to sort of um, find out what was happening with those populations as well, because they're even less likely to engage in anything at all. Um, and started to do some work with that around public health um, education, uh, public health England's consultation. So it's very early days, but we are sort of, yeah, making inroads um, very slowly. And I'm, you know, and any advice anyone can give me about the fact that I'm unfortunately white, I'm female, all those things that aren't going to really go in my favour to, to work with those communities to help engage and be seen as an authentic and genuine wanting to try and support the voice to be um, heard more effectively. Please let please contact me. I'm happy to hold a webinar for anything. I've already mentioned that to Barbara. You know, that's our job really is, is to find where the, where the um, energy is and to amplify it. So I don't know if that really answers your question, but that's what we've been trying to do. Yeah. Okay, we have another question um, about um, are there any um, black led organizations that are being given um, some of these contracts and if so, what sort of percentage of black led organizations that would be leading on any of these um, um, contracts around social prescribing. Um, I, I suppose from our perspective, what I would, what I wanted to say um, was that how we've, how we've given the money across the voluntary sector is the, is the leads from each community voluntary action are managing that work and disseminating it. So um, there's no particular, it's at a very high strategic level and then working on the ground with communities. So at this point, we never, we were never able to be in that position of giving it out to specific communities. This was about them getting the message out on our behalf 
to all those communities about thriving communities program. So that's the answer for there. And we're not in a position to give out any funding anywhere else. So I can't comment on the rest of it. Mm. Yeah, we'll have to see what happens with the Threaties Fund, whether we do have any black led um, applications. I would hope that there will be uh, to be honest, um, the fund has been launched later than everyone would have liked. So it's quite tight uh, for people. Uh, your video. Ah, you still hear me? Yes, we can still hear you, Richard. Thank Just you. Just stop my videos. You'd have to look at my my face. That's good. Um, <laughs> um, like to see your face, Richard. Yeah. What am I saying? Yeah. So, so we're hopeful. We're not. Um, we're not got the capacity. Uh, we've got the role because there's so many different agencies involved in this in giving one to one. Uh, advice or support for applications but we are what we are trying to do is we run some webinars on this um, and I think going forward not just with this fund but with project grants and other uh, open funding programs that we have uh, we'll be doing so much more targeted we have already been doing it with the sector support organizations in the field but much more targeted work so I think mean, this is a good example of, of how we'd like to reach out and and uh, make ourselves open and accountable to communities um, and I think more broadly because this is a this is a, in a lot of the questions uh, quite understandably is what what is our approach now to diversity in the lights of Black Lives Matter and George Floyd and, and the rest of it and I think um, like many organizations, we are really looking very hard at ourselves. Darren uh, Henley, our CEO, said he wants to be held accountable for this. We're doing an audit of what we're doing uh, in, in, in terms of diversity. As I said earlier, in terms of the, de uh, the delivery plan for this and the new strategy, we're looking at uh, inclusion and relevance, um, and the inclusion um, part being much stronger than, than the creative case. Uh, was I think because we, as I said we are looking across the board at programming workforce opportunities and so on and it's be, been a, a dis, you know a, a very important factor in relaunching the project grants as well as recognition that um, uh, there are communities and individuals that have not benefited from from our funding programs in the past as much as they should have done mm -hmm. so I, I think we are working working hard on this and uh, uh, we want to make us uh, along with and you know, other people the arts council to come and talk to, to groups um and you know on the lewisham uh, front we yeah, are very much aware very excited by by lewisham um and i know the uh, lewisham education arts network there and, and various bodies that I work with very closely are based in Lewisham, like in Teleki and, and Heart and Soul, who've done a lot of work during this pandemic of this kind. So um, I, I think we'd be very, very interested in applications, um, you know, from Lewisham and, and from, from around, around the country. <laughs> Sorry, that's a bit, bit vague, wasn't it? But I hope that makes sense. We, we have quite a number of questions in the, the chat that we unfortunately will not get the chance to, to, to address now because we are coming to a point to wrap up. And I mean, it just shows the importance of this subject and um, some of the concerns that the community has around um, funding and reach mm -hmm. and diversity and um, being involved right from the get go um, of, of these, the, the, the setting up of these networks and and how funding is actually going to be distributed because if if um if we're not organized we're, if we're not represented at the beginning then how are services being designed for communities that unfortunately are not quite being reached um so what i um would like to just say before we wrap up is uh, just a uh, go around and if there's any final thoughts from each of um the speakers today um, that would be great, and we can um, wrap that up. And um, yeah, we'll start. Okay, Patrick, would you like to go first? Yeah, one thing I didn't get a chance to mention is the work I'm doing with uh, Yabele, uh, with Velta, a partnership called Bamestream, which is a network of Black and Asian uh, organisations around the field of therapies. So it involves the organisation. Uh, BATAN, which is a network of Asian black therapists, Nasriat Centre, uh, 
um, the BME members of the British Psychological Association, uh, a number of other individuals and BME voices. And we've launched this way because as a result of COVID-19, as you know, uh, tens of thousands of people from Black and Asian communities have died uh, in Britain because of COVID-19. That's had the impact on their families, as well as the general break impact of lockdown and social isolation. So we've developed a bereavement um, support package. So we've commissioned Nasibiat who are delivering some support services on the ground. And actually in many ways, this could be a good model for sort of prescribing because eventually it'd be fantastic for GPs to make referrals to um, our service and our service offer and to develop new types of services to engage with communities because sadly in 2020 there is no national offer around reflecting the cultural sensitivities and BME communities around uh, bereavement nationally. I mean it's Cruz and other organisations and we're working with them so this is a clear example where social prescribing could work uh, and make it culturally relevant as well. Thank you Patrick. Richard? <sighs> Yes. Um, thoughts. Final thoughts. I just think this is, uh, I hope this is the first of, of many conversations that we're, we're going to have going down the road. I was just thinking that um, one of the grants we made recently was to Incarts, of course, produce that BAME Over document, which is really interesting. Um, and we've, we've supported their therapy uh, work for diverse people in the sector. And I, I think that's, that's a good, a, a, good example of what we can do both around our main funding streams um, and I'm hoping that the Thriving Communities Fund and um, I, I, I know in the questions I've been asked about the deadline I thought I caught from Stephanie that it was changed to the 24th but I may have got that completely wrong it's still the 8th it's still the 8th of January but I'm, I'm hoping that that will you know we will learn from that um, and that there will be further funding of that kind because that's that's the way forward um where community organizations voluntary organizations can um form partnerships one of the exciting things that's happened and I'll, I'll stop in a moment um and it's one of the links I'm, I'm sending through is um the london arts and health form which is the sector support organization uh, for london arts and health has set up a new website called partner up um, and that is actually aimed initially, at least, at arts and cultural organisations that want to find partners uh, initially, maybe to make an um, application to the Thriving Communities Fund. But it could obviously have a life and will have a life beyond that, um, because that's that's the way forward for, for social prescribing. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, um, we've got very short time left, but um, Stephanie? Uh, just to say... You know, I'd really love it if everybody here would contact me, tell me what your problems are, what you need, because I need evidence to prove to all these other players that there's a real problem, and particularly for particularly around Black and minority ethnic communities not getting the funding, the, the group's not getting the support. I can't do it without you. So that's my plea to you guys as a next step, and I'll do what I can to support you as collectively, so you're not just one voice on your own. Thank you. And Mike? Any final thoughts, Mike? Yeah, sorry, very quickly. I think the final thoughts are that the issue really isn't about social prescribers. It's about what they've got to prescribe to. Um, mm. That's really what it's all about. I mean, I get fed up in Harringay because we keep recruiting more and more social prescribers. So we don't need any more. We actually need something for them to prescribe to. If yeah. you look at the NHS outcomes, there's three outcomes. One's impact on GPs. One's impact on the person, the patient. The other one's the impact on the voluntary and community sector. That makes me laugh because they, they seem to think this is going to help the voluntary and community sector, but they're doing nothing to help it. And that's their third outcome. So, yeah. Thank you. Maybe some of that money that they've um, earmarked for um, link workers can go back into the community. Uh, <laughs> um, so, Barbara, the final word to you, please. Yeah, very final words. I mean, I, before this, I was in a meeting with... Um, um, a, a GP practice looking at how they can co-design with the community uh, personal service and looking at what the link workers can do so I'm involved in that piece of work which will go on until about February so on the ground I'm actually kind of getting involved in that and that's really exciting but I think um, the link workers 
I think that they, they could, that's a pathway to employment, particularly for young people. Mm. And the I asked that question, were they saying these things? Oh, well, you know, could that be a, a part, rather than the voluntary thing, can't we just create this as a, a pathway into employment for jobs? Because there's lots of young people who know their area, know everything and new organisations you couldn't begin to imagine that they could do that. So, you know, if they, I think there's something around ring fencing, some money for BAME organisations who can do all kinds of things, provide employment, uh, grow organisations that can step in and fill the gaps, which is what our familiar project showed, that we did things that people hadn't even thought about um, and that we're actually being paid to provide the excellence that we wanted. We just recruited um, somebody to work on diabetes with a GP practice, a primary care network, and asked if I would go in and help her with her induction around faith health and equalities. Well, I'm a business, so, you know, not for free. So I think it's, it's just a different approach. And I think if, if you look at the impact of COVID and if you look at what you're doing and the money is not flowing where it needs to go, I would like everybody here to advocate that that happens. And I've got an infrastructure organization that's being set up in Lewisham because of this gap and happy to try anything with anybody. Uh, we're looking for money for core costs and to develop projects. I've got about five organizations waiting to talk to me right now to develop their ideas and create the collaborations and, and synergy between them so that's thank the kind of way I'm looking forward to. Thank you so much Barbara and I think you know this is really just the beginning of a conversation that needs to be had and thank you to all of the um, panelists for giving up some of your time to really help to try to demystify and unpick some of the issues and um, thank you to all of you um, who um, have come on board and I think you know please stay in touch with the Abelli Network I think this is really raising a big issue that we really need to be able to maximize on some of the opportunities to make sure that they reach right across communities to make sure that all communities are served through it. So thank you so much again for your time. And I'd like to say thanks again and bye-bye. And um, Pamela, if you could stay on board. And um, I just want to say thank you to everyone as well, as well as Eileen for um, hosting this conversation. And if you are not already on the newsletter, please go to ubele.org and sign up and register. We have lots of events coming up and we hope to continue this conversation as well. So thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.